I'm in class. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Larry Lederman. I'm the chair of the Ambassador Speaker Series. And thank you for coming tonight. This is our last event in this academic year. And before we introduce our guest speaker, I would like to recognize some members from the Diplomatic Corps, uh, the Ambassador of Norway, Her Excellency Mona Brother, uh, the, the Ambassador of Sweden, <laughs> <laughs> there are more. <laughs> uh, the Ambassador of Sweden is Excellency Teppo Torian. Oh, there's Teppo there. uh, The Ambassador of Georgia is actually Alexander Latsavi. Uh, the Ambassador of Kazakhstan, Konstantin Zigolo. And the Ambassador of Poland, His Excellency Martin Mostaki, who I think is the most recent to arrive. We have representatives also of the embassies of China, Turkey, Yemen, Japan, uh, Ukraine, of course, and the delegation of the European Union, and the Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Development, other ministries and agencies of the Government of Canada, Carleton University, the University of Ottawa, as well as those from the private sector and some of my former colleagues and good friends who are former ambassadors uh, abroad, like Craig McDonald, to Finland, and Chris Westall, uh, who is ambassador to Ukraine and to Russia. And have I forgotten any other former? No. Um, uh, it is, and the um, last but not least, the ambassador of Chile, His Excellency Roberto Ibarra, <laughs> who I just want to say, oh, and all, uh, more, uh, uh, just say that uh, the ambassador of Chile has been here some four or five years and a close friend has just been named uh, the new ambassador of Chile to Peru. So we only have him for a few more months. And uh, finally, and not least, uh, former ambassador of Canada to Kazakhstan, uh, Margaret Skok. You can clap. <laughs> now it is my pleasure to ask the Dean of the Faculty of Public Affairs of Carleton University, Dr. André Fleur to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you, Larry. Welcome to, on, the, on behalf of the Faculty of Public Affairs, welcome to Carleton. This should be a very interesting uh, evening. <laughs> Ambassador Vadim Pristaiko graduated from the Kiev Polytechnic Institute in Computer Science and then studied for his master's degree at the Ukrainian Academy of Foreign Trade. In 1994, after working in the private sector, where he founded one of the first Ukrainian internet providers, he entered the Ministry of Foreign Economic Relations following his family's tradition of government service. In 1997, Ambassador Pristeko joined the economic section of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, responsible for developing trade with Asian countries. His first foreign post in 2000 was at a consul in Sydney, Australia. In 2002, he returned to Ukraine where he was assigned to the foreign policy director of the presidency of Ukraine. In 2004, he was posted to the Ukrainian embassy in Ottawa as political counselor. Four years later, the ambassador was appointed deputy director general for NATO in Ukraine's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In 2009, he was named Minister Counselor and Deputy Chief of Mission at the Embassy of Ukraine in Washington. And on November 12, 2012, the President of Ukraine appointed him Ambassador to Canada. Welcome back. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ambassador Vadim Krusek. all of you for gathering here today. It's a great privilege and honor to be here and to be able to talk to you and tell you a couple of words on my own and listen to your questions and try to, to answer any of those questions you have. I will try to be short. I have like 20 minutes, I was told. Maybe maybe a bit more for the Q&As. I will try to save the time for Q&As. And I will focus my today's presentation around three quite major and quite logical points as I believe. First of all, a couple of words of Ukraine, what's going on right now, and how Ukraine changed after the fall of Yanukovych regime. 
and how we try to, to reset ourselves in a democracy and Euro European integration path. And how the first political government in our, in our history trying to make reforms, hopefully for the better of all Ukrainian society, Ukrainian business, and our partners around the globe. Second, I can just avoid talking about Russia and Russian invasion, invasion to Crimea. I will, I will try to give you some, some things so you'll be able to consider whether the Ukrainians, events in Ukraine are posing threat to, to uh, sovereign democracy in Mr. Putin's building in, in Russia, and whether aggression and annexation of Crimea and encouragement of separatism in Ukraine intended to prevent our European past, or is just the effect of what he is, do, what he is doing. The third one is about international community. How the events in Ukraine are perceived by international community, our partners, the whole, the whole globe, whether the um, international community is taking this last uh, example of the execution of rights of, of stronger, whether they, they will take that the all the international uh, mechanisms that have been, been, been built and been cherished by all of us are so easily destroyed in, 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 to the to the wish of of some of the. Security Council members and the nuclear powers. So the major points for those of you who've been hibernating during the uh, the winter 2013 2014 and the peace first part of of uh, spring. By the way, not all the bears were you know hibernating all this time. Some of them were proved to be quite quite active. I'd like to <laughs> remind you what actually happened in Ukraine. So our government was about to sign the European Association Agreement on the 28th of, of November. But just a couple of days before, government decided to change the pass and opted for the $15 million uh, loan from, from uh, Russia, the Russian Federation. It's okay, it's still within the powers of the government to decide the, the course, although this course was, was uh, the key, key course of Ukraine's uh, 23 years of independence, to Europe, to West. He decided to change so that brought people on the streets for the peaceful demonstration, which turned ugly after the 30th of November when the government decided to dispel the uh, students from the major street of Ukraine, which actually just infuriated Ukraine, especially key events. Close to one million people came on the streets to show that it's not acceptable. We won't be, we won't be tolerating this. In turn, the government decided to go even stronger. So by the end of February, the stubborn demonstrations were met by, by force, with force, with law enforcement agencies, and eventually the shootout was authorized on the, on the streets of ancient city of Ukraine, of Kiev, which uh, brought 103 people dead and more than 1,500 injured and wounded. We are talking about military injuries, less arms amputated, eyes lost, serious stuff. What happened next days? Viktor Yanukovych fled the country and resur re resurfaced in Russia, read the prepared statements calling everybody in Kiev fascists, neo-Nazists, <coughs> Benderci, and, ex and expectedly invited the aggressor to come to Ukraine to, to help to reinstate him back on the throne. The, uh, these events, I know that the more of them since then are much more well known to the public. I don't want to play the Captain Obvious, but just wanted to bring the very important crucial moment to you right now for the sake of our uh, next uh, conversation. That so-called the, the issue of legality of new Ukrainian government has been used by, by Russian propaganda very extensively. So what, 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 what we have now? People are calling this government we have now in theory. It's a mistake, uh, even, even our Canadian friends are calling this government in theory. My point is that we still preserve the parliament we had over the two, two years and this completely legal parliament elected the new prime minister and the and the uh, government itself. Only two ministers are in theory, Minister of Foreign Affairs, my boss, and Minister of Defense, who are supposed to be appointed by president and expecting the presidential elections on May 20th, 25th. Although our Russian friends already hinted that they won't recognize it. The, the interesting point here is so-called agreement being signed between three leaders of opposition. It's another question how they represented the people on Maidan, on the major square of Ukraine. But let's leave it aside for, for, for a minute. This agreement was signed by Mr. Yankovic, the leaders of opposition, and co-signed by ministers of foreign affairs who came as negotiators and interlocutors and intermediates 
in the meters, uh, France, Germany, and Poland. Russian representative was also in the room, but refused to sign the agreement, decided that it's too much. Although Russians forget about this particular po point, and now they're referring to the agreement without you know, even taking, giving any care to the, mo to the fact that they did not sign it in the, very, uh, the first moment. Mr. Yanukovych, on the next day in the morning, when he signed that he will reinstate the Constitution of Ukraine in 2004, which means that his powers will be balanced by the Parliament's, by the parliament's power, he did not fulfill this first clause of the agreement, and he fled. By this, he was the first one not to respect the newly signed agreement. Since then, everything started, you know, you know the history, I just tried to, to explore it uh, in a, bit, a, bit of, a couple of words. So the first positive results, like reinstating the constitution, the uh, re bringing back the presidential parliamentarian model, I have, to, I have to tell you that's important now part of the globe. Out of 16 countries of the uh, Soviet Union, or republics of Soviet Union, only three introduced the uh, parliamentarian uh, uh, system from the very beginning, three Baltic nations. And they were the most successful ones. All the rest, 12 of us, took the presidential, strong presidential powers, and all of them, all the republics came to the same more at the same point when this <coughs> government and this president became more and more tyrant circus style of, of government. So the, uh, we managed to make many, many political things, but all these achievements were outshadowed by the submerging economic performance. The GDP falls 3% at least, huge debts, and balanced budget, and social complications. These things are serious. Separatism, the huge, the, the huge territory of Ukraine, it's not as big as Canada, but still biggest by square mileage in Europe. Divided loyalties, you can see on the on streets and you can see from TV, that's how, how divided loyalties of Ukrainians themselves. The radicalization of certain, certain sectors of society, that's also true. What tasks were assigned to the new government of Mr. Yatsenyuk? He himself, by the way, called his own government as kamikaze government. So these tasks are simple. Take unpopular and painful steps to avoid default in Ukraine. Easy. Balance the state budget, reduce public spending, hold fair and transparent presidential elections, begin necessary political legal reforms, and so on, and so on, and so forth. Proposed by many, including Russians, the federalization of, of Ukraine and second official language will hardly enforce Ukraine, Ukraine statehood, and frankly, it's not Russia's business to what to introduce in Ukraine, but will definitely will have to draw the lessons from, from, the, from the past, and we already decided to introduce the model close to Polish model. We took this uh, as a very good example. How to give more powers to the to the uh, regions? It's not federalization; it's rather decentralization. We're talking about budgets, formation, language, education, many many things. How the uh, the regions will self-govern themselves. Stabilization of state finance system. We have to sharply cut uh, the spend expenditures, save the budget. Review the taxation system, cut subsidies to the to the vulnerable sectors of the economy. It's a very painful decision. By now, we already cut 10% of subsidies to to mining region, which is eastern region, which is less loyal to the government. But that's the only the only path we can take. We, I have to tell you, I feel it myself. We now we're cutting our state staff by at least 10% which is, we're already talking about 24,000 people to be fired next month. And these people are well-educated bureaucrats and it's not easy to, to find the jobs for these 24,000 people immediately. We're selling all the state cars and residents, official residents, all this stuff we can, we can live without. In return, we hope to have, a, sorry, we're not reducing, we have a couple of things to increase, for example, taxation and domestic tariffs. These things will probably, hopefully, bring us the uh, loans from the IMF and other in, in financial institutions. We are talking about 14, maybe 18 billion dollars immediately. That's that's the 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 big chunk of money we have to have to avert the immediate crisis to the, to the finance of Ukraine. We managed to sign this association agreement with the European Union, partially. We have to, we, you know, we, we enjoy another sour fruit of real politics. 
the European Union was ready to sign the agreement with the government of Yanukovych. Even after the everything started, they were reminding Yanukovych that the association agreement is still on the table. By a couple of days ago, we were able to sign part, political part. It's complicated, I am not going into details, but we have to sign the rest of it probably after the presidential elections, if we manage to have them on the May of 25th. It's not easy, but that's the way. Although I also have to admit that the European Union made a very good step by opening unilaterally the markets for Ukrainian companies. We are talking about $500 million by the end of the year in benefits of the opening of European uh, markets for Ukraine. To ensure the independence, energy independence, which is extremely important in Ukraine, we have to talk with, with European Union and try to, try to find other ways to how to resupply Ukraine. We need around 50 billion cubic meters a, a year. We are, we are individual biggest consumer of Russian gas. I know that the European Union is very much pre preoccupied with, with Russian gas, but I have to remind you, we are the biggest uh, cons consumer of the Russian gas. We, and today, from today, they actually decided to raise the price at least $100. I will, I will come to it just in a second. We have to, to do a lot of reforms. I, I don't want to bother you with things that are like judicial system, prosecutor's office, security service, police. We have to do something with the police, especially how to deal now with police forces, with those people who are shooting at their fellow countrymen. And of yesterday, we decided finally to give an order to each and every paramilitary, paramilitary structures to return, to, to disarm and return the, uh, the weapons which they had in their possessions to the uh, internal, internal military, internal affairs. All the things we are doing, we are doing for us and for our integration in Europe. Some, some believe that all the things can be perceived in Russia as a threat to the system they have, and that's why it can be ignored, can be avoided, and so it has to be dealt with. I'm not sure if it is the case, but what we see, that's what we what we have now in our hands. The, regardless of the rhetoric they use, the one fact is obvious. They are not only just betraying the brotherly nation, very close, the, probably the closest nation they have historically. They are showing again that there is still a rule of stronger in this world and it's still in full effect. <coughs> we have to admit, the, the things, the, the steps which are taken by, by Putin, the, that's the propaganda, that so-called Putin's tourists in Ukraine, the commanders which are coming secretly to, to Ukraine's territory, it it's all is working to some extent. The system, the Ukrainian government is put to the stress. We have to, instead of going through the reforms, we have to pour our, our limited resources in the army, trying to, to, to prepare it for the, for the battles. We're digging up the uh, anti-tank ditches. You know, in the middle of Europe, it's quite unexpected. For me, there's wide ditches. Uh, we didn't want and nobody would ex expect to happen in this part of the world. About economics or what, what happens and the uh, effects. What is Crimea? It's two million people. It's a huge, huge island. It's actually a uh, peninsula of it, which is connected with just one road. Two million population. In Ukraine's term, is 3.7% of GDP of Ukraine and 4.3% of Ukrainian of Ukraine population. Export import around 1.5, 1.6%, not significant to our survival. At the same time, the in, in, in energy independence and survival of Ukraine actually been hurt, and quite significantly. We lost the fields of oil and gas and gas concentrate around, around the Crimean territory. We are talking about uh, 170 billion cubic meters of gas, 47 million tons of oil, 18 million, million tons of gas condensate. At the end of 2014, Ukraine developed only 4% of, this, of these deposits. Our companies were exploring and were extracting around 7 million cubic meters of gas annually, which the internal consumption of Crimea around 1.4, 1.5 million. So the 4 million cubic meters were exported to the mainland of Ukraine for, our, for, the, for the use of the whole Ukraine. Again, to the prices, you know, that's the, that's, I, I can't just avoid it to call it hypocrisy, sorry. We have this agreement with Russia that we will pay less $100 for this, we will allow them to stay, to station their fleet in, in Crimea. Today, just today, Mr. Medvedev mentioned that because of the changed 
geopolitic reality, he called it this way. They don't need anymore to pay Ukraine this $100 for keeping their fleet because they are not keeping fleets in Ukraine. They are, they are, that's their own territory from the day yesterday. So we have today from today the price increased for $100 again. Close to Canadian, to Canadian reality. We have to postpone the launch of the satellite which we built with MDA, the Canadian company, and we paid $260 million for the satellite because we lost communication system which was in Crimea. Now we have to rethink where we can, where we will be able to control this satellite and then probably we'll launch it later on as soon as we find out how can we operate it. What it brought to us, I mean all this, you know there are some, some positive things which brought with all this nightmare of the conflict. That's the maturity, that's the great maturity of the Ukrainian society. We went through very painful changes and there are some any, any very interesting things, like you know, the, the propaganda is talking about Ukrainians, neo-Nazis, anti-Semites. They are touching all the sensitive strings around the globe, understanding what people can react to, to which signals they will react. I have to tell you interesting facts. For example, one of the of the squads in Ukraine, in Maidan, in the central Maidan, was just Jews. They decided to have Jew hungry. Or absolutely unexpected thing, the Muslims, the Turkish, uh, the Turks, the Tatars, Crimean Tatars, invited Ukrainian Orthodox to have services in their mosques because they deprived from the churches they had before a chance to, to, to make the, to, to have their services in Crimea. For example, in the statement of Ukrainian Jewry to, to the uh, President Putin. And most likely you have mixed Ukraine and Russia, where Jewish organizations have noticed the growth last year of anti-Semitism. Our few nationalists are under the control of civil society and we can take care of. And the new government of Ukraine, which cannot be said about and the Ukrainian government, which cannot be said about the neonatism in Russia, which is encouraged by your intelligence agencies. Many, many things. I don't want to, to waste much of your time. The, I just want to, to come to the last point of my presentation. The international community and the approach to what, what, what's happening in Ukraine now. <laughs> we That's a very bad signal for so-called threshold countries. I'm talking about now the Ukraine, as you remember, in 1991 decided that we inherited the third biggest arsenal of nuclear weapons. Our weapon arsenal, nuclear arsenal, was bigger than Chinese, French, and Britain combined. In return to 1994, in return for giving up this nuclear arsenal, we were promised to be protected by five nations. One of these nations just was an aggressive, aggressive to our territory, occupied a piece of our territory. This signal was pick, picked up by many threshold countries, at least Israel already mentioned. Look at them. The only chance we can we can protect ourselves is to to expand our nuclear program. And I believe me, the Iranians are thinking the same. Maybe they're not doing it publicly, publicly but they're thinking about uh, about the piece of paper in which the agreement signed and the real nuclear and nuclear powers. We thank to all the countries who supported us, and especially the UN re re resolution. The UN resolution showed that this time more countries were trying to be united and protect one of their members against against the uh, the invasion. One hundred votes to support Ukraine's integrity and independence. 11 voices against. Russia, Belarus, Bolivia, Venezuela, Armenia, Zimbabwe, Cuba, Nicaragua, North Korea, Sudan, and Syria. That's, that's, that's the list. Just one last word about the Canada. I, I really grateful myself and I'm proud to be representing Ukraine here in Canada. The only member of G7, leader of G7 countries, it was Sim Harper, came to Ukraine in very, very difficult and delicate moment to show that they are standing behind Ukraine, trying to help. He brought $220 million as a loan. If you compare it to the billion which has been promised by, for example, the United States, and compare it to economists, that proportionally, Canada could spare more money to help Ukraine, even in this difficult, difficult situation. We have a lot of different programs. I don't want to bother you and bore you with, with all these names of ideas and the reforms and everything. Believe me, there are very interesting things. I just discussed today with Minister Alexander, Minister of Immigration, 
and see the distribution to some, some of them. So the Canadian government and Ukrainian government working working hard, and we understand that we don't have much time to, to proceed with that. And my sincere sincere gratitude go going to Ukrainian community, which was as never strong, united, and helpful, trying to push and pushing all the initiatives, and they stay behind all the initiatives, gathering money, sending delegations, pushing people out, having the beautiful programs like uh, treating medical, for providing medical treatment to those uh, injured on Maidan, hundreds of people. Instead of bringing a couple of dozens here, they decided to send a mission, and mission is leaving tomorrow. Doctors, equipment, people are working pro bono. This and, and many, many other projects are on our, on our consideration or work. So thank you very much. I will stop here and give you some time for your questions. Thank you. The ambassador is open to questions. I would ask those who wish to ask a question to come to this microphone, identify yourself, and proceed. Who will be the first person to ask a question? Kowalski. Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Kristeiko, uh, I'm Dan Kowalski. You know me well. Uh, uh, could you please enlighten us on what is happening in the uh, border regions with uh, in eastern Ukraine, Luhansk, Kharkiv, uh, Donetsk, and Odessa, and it's on Nikolai that the protesters, pro-Russian protests are going on. I haven't heard much on it. Could you enlighten us about that, please? Well, thank you. Uh, we are talking about uh, different, different realities here. One reality is 100,000 troops. And today, Mr. Lavrov mentioned, oh, okay, why all this fuss? Just simple, simple exercises, military exercises. And you know, some of our critics, uh, in, for example, Foreign Affairs, Russian, they mentioned their statement. For those who consider serious the invasion of Ukraine territory, have to, have to be described, prescribed with painkillers. They're even using this, you know, new type of diplomatic language with painkillers and, and just. Another reality is the uh, protests movement in these cities in the southeast. As I mentioned before, there is many factors divided loyalty. People are still calling President Yanukovych to come and to restore order. You know, they, they still don't, don't get the, the lesson from the, from the history. This guy stole so many, so much from them. He was building the palaces and, and all this gold and everything. And people, simple miners who are spending their life, wasting their life on the ground for a couple of dollars, they're coming out of it back and, and voting for the guy and asking him, begging him to get back and to restore order. They believe that this guy, he, he, what he was doing was to, to make an order. Another reality is Russian, so-called Putin's tourists. We, our security services have to pick them up very quietly because it will you know, ignite the, the whole process one much more. One by one, sometimes with weapons, sometimes with materials, sometimes with just, just with the documents of uh, Russian, Russian military and Russian army. So there is a mix of people. Those who are <coughs> sincerely don't understand what's going on, Sincerely believe the propaganda. The, the figures which just came to me recently and is really bothering me. 39% of Ukrainians are having their news, daily news about Ukraine, about their own life from Russian TV. I'm not talking about 92% of Ukrainian territory being covered by, by TV. It's different. I'm talking the people taking every word of what's going on next to them from the TV, from the next, next neighbor. That's, that's very interesting and it's very unique, I believe. You also, have, uh, 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 um, you also have chance to, to listen, to access to the United States media. At the same time, you are quite well understand what was going on next to you. Imagine people, 39% of them, thinking uh, and seeing through the eyes of Moscow, Moscow TV. These people seriously do not understand what's going on. They seriously believe that there are neo-Nazis who took over the power in Kiev, and they're coming. I was, I was just to give you an example how it is working. The uh, mayor of one of the cities was talking to his to, to the crowd, and he was using two examples just to tell them how bad the European Union is. First example that they're making cat foods out to Ukrainian women in Europe. Second one that. A million army of neo Nazis was just stopped by, by brave uh, Donetsk region people from entering Donetsk. A million. And both of these statements were welcomed by, by the crowd. I like that the women uh, part more in this cat food. <laughs> you know how seriously you have to be about it. 
you know, how seriously you have to be open for this sort of propaganda, even to take it seriously. You know, say, come on, what you're talking about? Next question. Um, yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Stephen Jump from the University of Geneva. I was wondering, um, as Switzerland's making a lot of great efforts to try and get some of the money that's been laundered into the country by some of the uh, main figures in this uh, movement, but um, I was wondering if you could comment a bit on that, if you think the money will be recovered, and what are the plans for it if it is? Thank you. You, you don't mind, I will take the close example of Canada. Mm -hmm. Canada already introduced the, the law, signed in the law, about 19 persons in the Ukrainian, previous Ukrainian government, with an idea this time, not just to locate this money, not just to freeze, but if they are located here to return to the Ukrainian economy. That's different from what we saw like 10 years ago, when now one of our uh, uh, corrupted politicians, prime minister at that time was picked up by FBI and he is now still in California in jail. Unfortunately, these funds were not returned to the Ukrainian economy and being seized by, by American authorities. This time we, tr we tried to be clever, and we talked before, and uh, the, the ideas are if to find and to repatriate. Canada, European Union, United States, and some, some other countries on bilateral, bilateral uh, agreements, they're doing it. Hopefully they will find, I, I still wait to, to hear the results. Hopefully they will be able to find this money. It's not easy, I understand, but we, we are counting on it, at least some of them. <coughs> Hi, Ash. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm Warren Morrison. I'm an alumni from the North Patterson School of International Affairs. Um, as you mentioned, energy security is a primary concern to both uh, Ukraine and the European Union. Um, although there are a number of options on the table regarding supplementing natural gas supplies, um, it seems unclear at this point exactly how that can be done and how it will be involved or who will be involved. Um, I have a quote from Whitney Stanko where she argues that spurred by Russia's takeover of Crimea, we believe the foreign policy uh, arguments in favor of energy exports are gaining momentum on Capitol Hill. Nevertheless, it remains unlikely that Congress will coalesce around the plan of, uh, on liquid natural gas exports, and highly unlikely that Congress will act on crude exports in the near term. So given that um, they have these barriers to supplementing this energy uh, shortage, um, what do you envision Canada's role to be? Uh, during your interview several weeks ago on the CBC, you implied that Prime Minister Harper's visit was not just a show of support, but an opportunity to enhance specific arrangements and agreements. Um, I don't know if you can answer this, but was there any discussion on Canada's role as a natural resource supplier, uh, if not on the expertise exchange? How does that help our relationship going forward? Thank you very much. Thank you. You know that we are uh, putting a lot of hope on the shale gas. We, Ukraine producing a third of the gas, of natural gas ourselves. But we are also producing the, the, one of the biggest uh, items on our export list is the fertilizers. Mostly they are taking the gas as the byproduct. So that's not about burning it. And people are talking, why would you burn less? Yes, we can burn less, but it's not about this. We are using this gas to, to create the fertilizer. So we'll be able to sell less, to export less. So that's the, the, whole, the whole vicious circle. At the same time, the, what, we, what we hope to have is the shell gas, as our friends in Poland, are doing, and we are sharing the same geological structure. We believe if they were able to find, we will be able to find. We are now exploring in two, in two fields, two, com two international companies, uh, Royal Dutch Shell and ExxonMobil, United States ExxonMobil, are now, they won the tender, and now exploring the gas, and trying to find and understand whether it is uh, even good for business or not. In this particular business, we see the Canadians right away, and we have the Canadian companies which can provide the expertise in how to deal with shale gas or use as, or be used as a subcontract. So they, they're doing it. It's, it's already set it down. Another one is about the really LNG bringing to Ukraine. You know, the LNG working this strange way that you can you can transport it for the short distance, which is very logical, but that's that's how it works in the business. By this price we have now is becoming feasible, economically feasible to bring the gas from Canada and the United States. They will be ready to export around two, three years, both Canada and the United States, and we believe that can be done. If it is done, only thing we have to think how to get the gas to Ukraine, how to make our friends from Turkey to allow our tankers to go through, which is not very easy, or how to use the systems, uh, pipeline system, which are already existing, or to build new, new ones, how to get this gas up, up <coughs> north to Ukraine. 
ask another question, and believe me, we are we're dealing with it right now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Anton Vizglasny, uh, I work here in Ottawa speaking in a personal capacity. Ambassador, um, let's talk about the May 25th election, a very important election. I'm wondering, um, is Ukraine planning to invite international observers, uh, for example, to help out countries like Canada uh, send large delegations? Uh, and also, um, a second question, if you have time, what can uh, like-minded countries, or you know, uh, countries that are interested in Ukraine's future, such as Canada, what can they do uh, you know, today, tomorrow, in the short term, uh, to help out with this crisis? Daku, thanks very much. Thank you. Elections of 25th. Uh, Canada actually set twice a world record of sending the biggest uh, observation <laughs> of the So when I talked two weeks ago with Prime Minister, he mentioned that I'm not going to beat it, but let's see. So uh, we hope that the last time it was 500 people. It's, it's considerable amount. And it's, it's considered of two big, big chunks. The one is government and the other one supported by Ukrainian community, which is, which is doubling the number of observers. Again, Ukraine is a pretty big country by itself. It's this, even this big number is not enough to cover all the, all the uh, polling stations. But I understand that the observers are becoming much more clever. They, they are coming to the places they knew before had problems over there. They know how to observe, how to pick up all the small and big things. And I have to tell you that Ukraine is, because we, sometimes we are shortening this cycle the, in 2004 and now, it, it allows us to make more cycles, and the the uh, society is maturing much much faster. What I'm bringing, to, where I'm bringing it, uh, we are sort of uh, trying to make the system fair. Not because people immediately turn and becoming fair. No, because the, we are having the uh, political competition, and when people do not know who will be their boss next day, they are becoming immediately very sort of law abiding citizens. And this is a very good sign. Because in Canada, for example, over 200 years, you went through ups and downs. We just had two, 20 years, two, two decades, which is, I mean, the, the, uh, the situation is different. Imagine in 20 years, we came from the system when we have just one party, one newspaper, one TV channel, to the 80 parties in the parliament, and 15, 15 uh, uh, people, candidates for the president. Today, we refused one very particular uh, candidate, Darth Vader. The guy changed his name to Darth Vader, <laughs> put the government, all the including helmet, and came to and then put in the documents. We had some law lawyers had to work out to you know to sort of derail him. <laughs> but the guy guy was guy was serious. So now we have around fifteen of them. Which is you know now this case is good because we have two million two million grievances you have to put on the table when you're trying to get in the in the presidential elections. If you are out of the post, at the end, the money stays with the, with the government budget. By this way, reaching, if anybody wants to become the president, please, by all means, just two million grievances. About the help of, of Canada to Ukraine, uh, some things I already mentioned. There are 200 million through the, through the uh, IMF, another million to uh, National Bank. Two, 20 million a year we are receiving as a technical assistance. That's, by the way, the only European country who is still in the program of, of CEDA. Over all the 20, 23 years, it mounted up to $410 million. Military exercises. We, we, this year, we'll have seven uh, exercises. In half of them, Canadians will take place on Ukrainian soil, and they will educate Ukrainian military officers here for the peacekeeping uh, languages. There are many things. I don't want to, to, to skip any. I don't want to offend anybody. But believe me, there are so many things University uh, degrees, a lot of a lot of things. Mark Sock, excellency, thank you. Um, as you know, I've been in and out of your country since uh, 1991, uh, and most recently in the last two years. Um, one of the important, um, perhaps, losses is the ports in the Crimea that are open uh, 12 months of the year. It's, it is Point and, and after the loss of the Baltic fleet, uh, we always knew that the uh, Black Sea fleet would be the paramount. So it's a question of what your plans are for shipment afterwards. And then the second question is everybody is very focused on energy, as they should be. But uh, when I was in Ukraine the last couple of years, <coughs> one of the statistics <coughs> from, 20, uh, from 2010 
that you have 43 million hectares of arable land. Major exports of grain, mostly wheat, but also feed grain, some barley, go to mostly Russia. So I was wondering about uh, agricultural economic reform. Ports, uh, ports, uh, yes, yeah, strategic importance, and uh, Ukrainian ports are the only so-called uh, worm water ports. As it was, it was the big Soviet Empire, Russian Empire, Soviet Union, the Odessa port was the only the only port which is opened for navigation the whole year. To lose this port, it was, I mean, great disadvantage for the Soviet Union for the Russian Empire. And sometimes Port of Odessa was uh, responsible of 11% of the old wealth of Russian Empire, over some 100, 200 years old. This Odessa port is on the mainland. In Crimea, we do have ports, mostly military ports, naval ports. They're important to us, not as much as Odessa port, which is a number of, of ports scattered around the Black Sea uh, banks of, of Ukraine mainland territory. To lose that, it would be a real disaster. We can live without ports in, in Crimea, but Odessa port is extremely important to us. That's why we're hearing that Russia and France are going to liberate the east and southern part of Ukraine, because that's important. And I have to remind you, the, for example, interesting fact, the Crimea is supplied by Ukrainian water, by mainland water. We have 400 kilometers channel going from the major river to Crimea to supply 82% of, of water. They can't survive without this water, neither agriculture nor just just domestic consumption. So they're dependent on this water on an energy. What we decided at some time, what we are considering seriously, how can we how can we supply these people with, with, with our water? And then we decided just to open, it was in 19th of March. We had this season of opening the, the channel. We just opened it. We can't, can't deprive people from from the, with, uh, with this water. Regardless of what they choose, as whether they choose to stay in Russia or to be Ukrainians. About the, about the agriculture, just a couple of words. You're right, and on some of the things we are, it's like buckwheat, I know it's not very important popular here, but in our part of the globe, it's very, very important. That's Ukraine's number one exporter in the world. Sunflower oil, number one. Wheat, number four. So we are, we are in a very serious business in, in agriculture. And the, the most important thing is how to privatize, privatize the, the land, or the land. This, this very painful issue, we're still not in the position to resolve it right now. We know that it's important for the business. It's not there yet. What we are considering now, how to help business, microcrediting, all the things, transportation, how to build up this, the uh, abilities of, this, of the farms, how to, how to bring people to this you know, historical understanding of, of value of this land. We do uh, possess the third of the black soil soils in the world, and we share this. Uh, God's gift, and we're trying to, to make it the maximum out of it. Uh, Elliot Taylor from Carleton University. Ambassador, thank you very much for all these detailed answers. Uh, part of my own ancestry goes back to the Ukraine. During the height of the Cold War, when a lot of new states were emerging, they were forced to choose one side or the other, but many chose not to do so and emerged as not aligned and then benefited from both sides. Why has it been a situation where for the Ukraine it's either or instead of both uh, Europe and Russia in the past and assuming we've survived this crisis period, is there a possibility that in the future <coughs> the Ukraine will end up being a partner of both Russia and Europe? We can change our geography. We are attached to this piece of land and there is nothing we can do, nor our, our neighbors. And that's, we will be there and we will reset our relations with Russia as soon as the possibility is opening. That's, that's quite understandable. At the same time, you know, each and every time I hear about taking or not taking alliances, I have to remind you that in our surrounding, in our neighborhood, there are no non-block countries, more or less. Russia itself had a part of the, of the block, of the military block. Every time they ask us, why would you go for any military block? Why would you stay non block? Yes, it's a good question from the country which is already part of the block. It's Tashkent Park. So there, from one side is, is NATO, from the other side is Tashkent Park, and everybody asking, so why would you stay neutral, sort of? But history is saying, for example, take the neutrality of, of Austria. 
which had been breached twice by Germans during World War II. An interesting, interesting fact, why we've never been neutral in our constitution or documents, we never had it. Regardless of, despite all the things we, you, you might hear, we never had this party constitution. Because each and every time we were considering neutrality, even theoretically, we have to think what we will do with Russia based on our territory. Because you can be neutral having somebody else military base. Now this issue is resolved by Russians. We don't have any base in our territory because this territory belongs, at least in their heads, to Russia themselves. So immediately, today, they start with this, this conversation. So guys, why would you be neutral? Because before we were talking about non-block, which you know, there is no such thing in, in a non-block state. It's very difficult to, to even grasp what you mean. You're not aligned to any block and how it is how it is written in the, in the international documents, how it can be protected, defended as, as a status itself. For, maybe I'm wrong guy to ask, because I was working for Ukrainian NATO negotiation team, and I believe in what I was saying, that Ukraine has to be a part of the, Ukraine, of the European nation family, both in European Union and NATO. Some people might bring you better examples, like I've been hearing things like, why would you want to go behind the bars of NATO and poke the bear for you? It's not our idea. We don't want to poke anybody. We just want to be as safe as those who are inside NATO or inside the European Union. We don't want, at the same time, we don't want to go to Tashkent attack because we've been before towards the attack. And we see it even now, when between Belarus and Russia, it was milk war some two years ago. And Belarus was chairman of, of the Tashkent pack at the time. They wanted to have the military exercises. And Belarusian, because they've been so so angry by Russian by Russian war, the trade war, decided not to have. You know, exercises happened anyway. So that's so much about the uh, way of running this business. It's not like NATO, which is consensus built organization. Although in the, in the books it is consensus built, but that's that's an example of whether it will be respected this consensus building system or not. Last question. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Excellency. It will be a hard lighted question uh, for you. So I hope you're enjoying kind of in winter. It's your second winter, and we all coming from hibernation here. So imagine that you are hibernated here in Canada, and uh, you wake like, up. Sorry if I offended anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but you uh, wake up. You know, science can do it in ten years. And what kind of Ukraine you would like to wake up in? Give us a feel. What kind of Ukraine would you for? Thank you. It's a good question. Uh, it's not because you have Polish <coughs> roots. It's not because my friend, Ambassador of Poland, here present. But, but that's more or less what, what we see Ukraine is. More or less by territory, by population. It's very close mentally, historically. Although we fought a couple of times with Poland. <laughs> 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 But I believe that's a very good, very good example. If and if we are not going into details, that's more or less thing we would we would try to do. We don't want to copycat. I believe that Poland also went through quite painful process, and they're still running in, in some obstacles and problems. But that's more or less the system we can expect to be in ten years. When later on, at, at, we will see. I don't know. Maybe maybe some maybe Canada. We'll see. Thank you. Uh, and to Ukraine, Christopher Westall, to thank our ambassador. Thank you, Larry, excellencies, and ladies and gentlemen, and excellency. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to have a chance to thank you. Um, I thank you for your speech. I thank you for those answers. You heard us all riveted and listening very carefully. I learned, I'm sure we all did. Uh, but I want to thank you for more than that. Uh, I uh, have been watching heads of mission, ambassadors and high commissioners and senior diplomats, and many here have also been watching uh, heads of mission reform. I've been doing it for 40 years, and I was one myself for quite a while. And I have been watching your performance uh, day uh, after day now for three months every day. Uh, and I was aware of it before that. I know you've been here 14 months, and I know you were here four years before. You're uniquely qualified for 
for this job. But I can say, having seen you uh, on the television regularly, having seen you on the front pages, having met with you, having imagined uh, the almost unimaginable complexity of the circumstances that you've dealt with over these 14 months, and particularly the last four, if one wants to stop to think of the complexities of the developments at home and the gradual disintegration of faith in the government and then a sudden unexpected change in the government, and you are representing that country throughout. Uh, and then the change and the complexity of your audience here in Canada, where there are a million people with relatives and ancestors in Ukraine, and there are many millions, including me and many others who have been taking this crisis to heart for four months now and watching it. I can say in all, in all of that time uh, that I've been aware of what ambassadors are responsible for, your performance has been one of the finest that I've ever uh, witnessed. And I think that it's very timely that that uh, example be now in this city, and that that example of what a diplomat can be, and, and must be when he must rise to an occasion, as I say, probably more complex and daunting than ever I can imagine a Canadian diplomat has faced. We have not had such tumult on the home front to represent, and we have not had the circumstances that you have in terms of, of who you represent. Now listen, I could go on, I don't want it too much, but I want to thank you for that performance, I want to thank you for that example of professional excellence, a very uh, timely example. I also just want to thank you for the years you've spent here. You're 20 years into a career, you have a stunning uh, CV, you've got much more time to go than you've yet spent and you're already in a leading uh, and important position of responsibility in your country, and I'm sure that uh, you will have more, and I wish you well in them. I know I speak for everyone here uh, in thanking you for what you've done this evening here and what you've been doing for your people with such excellence for the last 14 months. So truly, thank you. before we go to the adjacent room for reception where you'll be able to have a chat with the master Kistaiko. But last, I would like to ask the director of the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs, Dr. Dane Rowland, to present a souvenir of this evening to our ambassador. So I'm sure you don't need a reminder of these times that you're facing, but this is a token of our appreciation for having taken time out of your busy schedule. Please let's go to uh, for a drink. Thank you.